need to be anything other than a specialist sign. I don't have to be anyone other than the birth of two souls in one. Part of where I'm going. Supposed to be, I don't want to be anything other than me. I'm surrounded by liars everywhere I turn, and I'm surrounded by imposters everywhere I turn. I'm surrounded by identity crisis everywhere I turn. Am I the only one who noticed? I can be the only one who's learned. I don't want to be anything other than what I've been trying to be lately. All I have to do is think of me and my peace of mind. I'm tired of looking around, always wondering what I gotta do or who I'm supposed to be. gonna have to leave. I came from the mountain, the crust of creation. My whole situation made from clay to stone and now I'm telling everybody I don't want to be anything other than what I've been trying to be lately. All I have to do is think of me and I peace of mind. What I gotta do Or who I'm supposed to be I don't wanna be anything other than me What a fun way to start us off. My name is Josh Power, and I am the student pastor here. Uh, but before we get started, uh, we want to get your opinion on a few things. And so yesterday, we kicked off college football. Anybody excited that college football is back? Yeah? All right, so I got to know, day game or night game? Day game, if your team is playing, would you rather have them play the day game or would you rather have them play the night game? Are you the one that wants to watch the game and go to bed? Or you're like, hey, I'm a night owl, like this is prime time, I want my team playing then. Day game, anybody day game, like I just wanna go to bed? Yeah, a couple, a couple out there. Night game, prime time, there it is, awesome. All right, hey, we're heading into fall right now. So uh, this is a drink that's coming around again. Pumpkin spice or no pumpkin spice? Ooh, this surprised me earlier. I was genuinely surprised. So raise your hand real quick. You want the pumpkin spice. Come on. Pumpkin spice. Raise your hand if like, no, pumpkin spice is, wow. It's not as big as I thought it was. That is surprising. All right. This is one that uh, I'm not surprised with, but we'll see how this, this service goes. First service was kind of expected. Uh, if your team is playing in the World Series, your baseball team is playing in the World Series, but your favorite football team is playing at the same time. What are you watching? I don't even have to do a vote on that one. That, that was self-explanatory. Awesome, awesome. Well, hey, thank you guys so much for participating. If this is your first time, welcome. We're so glad that you joined us. We'd love to connect with you. And one of the best ways for us to do that is with that is to scan the QR code on the seat back in front of you. So if you take your phone out, scan it, follow the prompts, 
and it will, it'll help us get you connected to all that God's doing here at Mountaintop. Today is also a great Sunday if you're new because we have meet the pastor after the service. So when you walk out of the auditorium, there's a tent out there. Our pastors will be over there. We'd love to connect with you and uh, just shake your hand and get to know you. So make sure you do that. But with that said, I'd love to invite you to stand and I'm going to hand it off to Tori. Josh, we're going to stand. We're going to worship this morning. It's a little wet outside, but it's a good morning to be thankful for all God's done. Psalm 91 says that I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. So could we just do that this morning? We can give him our whole heart as we praise him. We lift up that praise. We give him our full thanksgiving. Come on. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. 
we're lifting him high. We just sing that. Forever lift him high with all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, we lift you high and we praise you. forgiveness and for your mercy. Thank you for our future hope. Receive like crimson robes, 
draped over the ashes A wide open tomb where there should be a casket The children are singing and dancing and laughing The Father is a welcome This is our homecoming Roses in bloom pushed up from the embers Our rivers of tears flow from good times and memories Families are singing and dancing and laughing The Father is a welcome study and through all the, the stuff that we've been looking at with the identity series is that we would know that we would truly know that nothing in our past our present or our future could keep us from the love of God I'm gonna say that again nothing in our past nothing in our present nothing in our future could separate us from the love that's found in Jesus amen in our darkest times it's easy to believe the lies, the lies that tell us that God couldn't love us. And yet the truth is, the truth is we are sons. We are daughters of the most high God, amen? Let's sing these words out. spoke creation the God of heaven knew our names formed in his reflection we are his glory on display and his heart is good he is always with a cross he proved, he is on my side. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. No matter where we go, we're close to the Father's heart. And though we stumble, he will not let us fall. i 
that when the lies speak louder than the truth and then when we believe those lies you gently bring us back and you run toward us with open arms because we are your sons we are your daughters you love us we are chosen we're accepted we're loved because of who you are so, Lord, whatever joy, whatever sorrow we walked into this room with today, whatever we carried in, whatever is weighing us down, we lay it at your feet. God, give us eyes to see who we are because of you. You are good. You are worthy of praise. And you have chosen us and you love us. And we say thank you. And we give you praise. And we shout hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And everybody said amen. Amen. It's so good to worship together this morning. You can have a seat. Good morning. Hey, my name is Carter McKinnis. I'm lead pastor here at Mount Top. And it is so good to see you. Thanks for whoo, braving some weather to, to get out here today. <laughs> um, uh, so we're just, thanks for being here. And Wherever you are uh, watching at home, thanks for welcoming us. Yeah, My name is Jake Davis, and I'm the college and creative pastor here. And man, hasn't it been a great morning to worship together and uh, to, to just celebrate um, a new semester? 
Um, if you don't know this, college kids are coming back to campus. That's why college football started this past week. And uh, we are kicking off a new college semester in Mountaintop College Ministry as well. And that happens this week, Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Tuesday, September 6th at 7 p.m. right over here in uh, Modular A. We're going to kick off our new college ministry semester. And so if you're a college student in the room, we'd love to see you there. Um, we'd love to bring you in for a night of fun and uh, friends and worship and uh, just kind of introduce you to what we're doing here at Mountaintop for our college ministry. Yeah, and so if you have college students, if you know college student, uh, invite. If you see a twenty-year-old with a backpack, yeah. just tell them like, "Come on!" Pretty like, fun. invite them. Invite them on Tuesday nights. But uh, you may be thinking, "Hey, it's been a minute since I've been in college, uh, or my kids aren't there yet." But everyone that's watching and in this room can be involved. Would you first just be praying for Tuesday night and every Tuesday for our college students? But tell these folks of ways that they can plug in to be, yeah. be a part of it. Absolutely. We're looking for people who are hoping to make an impact in the next generation. And so what that looks like is if you want to be a small group leader and you just want to walk with a college student as they journey through life, trying to figure out what it looks like to follow Jesus in the real world, we would love to have you come and lead a small group or be a mentor for a college student. And that's really simple. You're just going to facilitate some conversation and kind of help them along the way. Because what we found is college students are really looking for um, someone who's a few steps ahead of them that can tell them, hey, life's going to be okay, and you can follow Jesus out here in the real world. And then if you uh, have any type of skills in music or tech, you know how to push a button or play an instrument or sing a song, we'd love to get you involved uh, helping us lead worship for college students. And then finally, we have found that the quickest way to a college student's heart is through their stomach. They love free home-cooked meals. Yeah. And so if you have um, a, a skill for cooking home-cooked meals, we would love to get you involved once a month cooking for our college kids. Yeah, so there's so many ways. We would love for you to be a part of that. And let me just say, through your generosity, if you give to the mission and ministry of Mountaintop, through your offerings, your gifts, your tithes, you are already investing in the next generation of college students. Two years ago, we didn't even have a college ministry. We had all these colleges around us, and we didn't have a way to really connect with them. And it is because of your generosity that we were able to get a ministry literally off the ground from scratch. You're investing in Jake. You're investing in Tori and Kane, who are on our staff team, uh, being a part of it, investing in getting this thing going because we want these college students at this critical stage uh, to know that they're loved and valued. So thank you for giving. Thank you for investing in college students. You can continue to give uh, and know that a part of that is making a difference in the lives of college students. There's so many digital ways to give that you see on the screen. And if you are here in person, you can give at those boxes uh, when you go out. And so let me just say thank you. Thank you for supporting uh, something that is making the difference in the lives of some young people. Yeah, yeah you can. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. Hey, today we are finishing up and I'm super excited to uh, wrap up this series, Lie Identity. Uh, so let's prepare our hearts for what the Lord wants to say. Please confirm your identity. One year ago today, the 2021 college football season kicked off. Now, 2022 kind of kicked off in full yesterday, but one year ago today, the 2021 season kicked off, and a game that was most likely not on your radar was the Rice Owls at the Arkansas Razorbacks. Any Whoopi Suey fans in here? We got a couple of, okay. Do you want to call it? I mean, you want to do it for us? Uh, he's like, no, 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 thanks. Any Rice Owl fans in here? Like, what's the, how do they do a cheer? What do the owls do? <laughs> Nobody really knows, but both services did that exact same thing. They're like, woo, woo. <clears throat> so in this game, quarterback K.J. Jefferson um, for the Razorbacks, it was to start his, make his very first start. And uh, no, his second start. And there were already kind of some questions in the fan base about 
Jefferson, uh, and it did not go well in this Rice game. He, uh, he started off in the first half going 4 of 11 for 21 yards. Now, if you don't know anything about quarterback stats, that's not good. Uh, that's not good, and Arkansas was losing to the Rice Owls 10 to 7 at halftime. Now, they, they rallied back in the second half, and they kind of found a way to win, and Jefferson played a little bit better, but it was kind of one of those ugly wins. If you've ever had, if your favorite team has just kind of had one, you're like, you know, we got out of there alive, we survived. It was ugly, and the questions before about Jefferson had just only magnified after that. They, they got bigger. The chat rooms, the media, the message boards were all began to, to to say all these things about the quarterback. <clears throat> and in the post-game press conference, they asked Arkansas head coach Sam Pittman about the noise surrounding his QB. And what he said, how he responded, stopped me in my tracks. He said, well, you know, everyone's got an opinion, but the only one that matters is mine. And KJ's our quarterback. Whoa. Jefferson would go on to have a really great rest of the year, and Arkansas would have their best season <clears throat> in years. And he returns this year to quarterback the Hogs again. <clears throat> but here's what we know about Jefferson or any player or any one, you know, any time that there's going to be a bad performance, no matter how many cheers they've gotten, the media, the message boards, the chatter is going to ramp up again and come out of the woodworks because what we know everyone has is just what, just what Pittman said. Everyone's got opinions, right? Everyone's got opinions. People have ideas about what they believe, and it can be so easy to believe, it can be so easy to, to think that I am what other people's opinions say I am. It can be so easy to believe that I am what he said, what she said, what they think about me, and we can get our identity wrapped up in the opinions of others. And by the time that we are finished today, I hope you'll be able to own the truth that only one opinion about you matters. And it's not mine, and it's not anybody else's. I want you to own your real identity and let go of this lie identity. This was actually important for Jesus himself. And we're gonna see in one of my favorite little almost hidden verses like it it's so it's just a small little passage how Jesus himself dealt with opinions now opinions come with the territory of leadership it, it's just the way it is and someone like a quarterback right what they always say about quarterbacks they get too much credit when they win and too much blame when they lose that's just kind of the way it goes or if you're a head coach or if you are a uh, or if you're any kind of leader if you are a pastor, a principal, a CEO, a boss, an administrator, a principal. If you are a parent, you're a leader, and I promise you, your opinions have, your children have opinions about your leadership. It's just kind of the way it is, and in this story that we're going to look about Jesus, he is rising in leadership. He is gaining popularity, and he is kind of getting a platform, but this is not like it is only leadership that this happens with. We have all, we have all dealt with opinions from other people. We have all had a lot of people say things about us that have shaped us, that have changed us. We have all experienced someone saying something unfavorable about, unfavorable about us, and we have had to deal with the baggage emotionally inside, sometimes for years or decades, of something someone said to us. Maybe we're still struggling with it. And we're going to dig into this story of Jesus in John 2 about opinions. But we're going to have to figure out a little bit about the nature of opinions before we get there. So I just kind of want us to talk about some things that are true about opinions before we look at this story to help us understand it better. The first thing when it comes to opinions is proximity impacts power. Proximity impacts power. In other words, how the 
closer we are to someone, the more powerful that opinion feels. Right? The closer you are to someone in proximity, the more powerful their opinion feels, the more their opinion matters. Parents, you're very close to your children. Your opinion with your children carries tremendous weight. Carries tremendous weight. I mean, we know this. Like, if someone that we love shares something negative with us versus a complete stranger, then the person that we love, the person that we're closer with, their opinion matters way more. The closer we are to someone, the more power their opinion holds over it. Whether they're good or bad, it doesn't matter. Those close to us can make us feel loved, valued, cherished. I mean, and sometimes it is actually the opinions of those that are closest to you that that shelter you from the opinions of the outside world. We have all had experiences, probably where we had situations at work or school, where we had a lot of voices in our life saying some things, but we had our home, our parents, our spouse, our family that was speaking life into us, and it sort of provided a shelter for us. But the opposite can be true, too. Some of the most damaging and harmful opinions that we can experience about ourselves happen in the context of marriage or dating relationships. Because the closer you are, the more powerful their opinions are. We've all had situations where someone that was close to us who had a parent who told us that we weren't worth anything or a coach or teacher that you'd never amount to anything or an ex that said you were too ugly or too clingy or too talkative or too something. And the closer you are, the more punch that it packs the more powerful opinions are. It's just true. It's just real. We just need to understand that when it comes to opinion, proximity impacts power. Second thing about opinions is that when it comes to opinions, volume impacts validity. In other words, when more people seem to have the opinion, it makes us think that it's true. The louder the volume is about something, the more it impacts how real that we think it is. The louder it is, the more people have an opinion, the harder time we have discerning whether or not the opinion is a fact. But you know this to be true. You know this, you know this, you know this. Just because a lot of people have the same opinion doesn't mean it's real. Doesn't mean it's true. Just because a lot of people share the same opinion doesn't mean that it's actually the right opinion. And social media has made this worse. Social media has made this worse, and it has rewired a lot of our understanding about identity. And it's hurting teenagers because they are now beholden to the opinions of everyone that sees their TikTok, everyone that goes on their Instagram post. And the online crowd can gang up for us on us so much. They can make fun of our appearance. They can make fun of our grammar. You ever had the grammar police come out on one of your posts? Right? They, can, they can make you feel like your idea is stupid. They can make you feel this small and it feels like the volume because there were so many comments so many comments so many comments and the volume feels so loud when in actuality it was four or five online trolls that's all it was but the comments the it it felt so loud and here's what you know here's what i want young people to know college students any of our young people or teenagers i want you to know this because you don't know this because you're not old like me and we lived in a world without these things but here's what i want to tell you 30 years ago you would not have cared what those four or five people thought but this thing and i love technology and i love social media this thing has made us think that we should care what those four or five people think because their volume is loud volume impacts validity john acuff who is a speaker and author uh, in nashville and i followed him for years and heard him speak several times he said this uh, that i loved he said 
Criticism that costs nothing is worth nothing. Criticism that costs nothing is worth nothing. In other words, if, if someone just shared a comment, most of the time anonymously, that was negative, that was hurtful, that was pointed, and it cost them 12 seconds, and they don't know you, and it didn't cost them any relational capital, they didn't even give you their identity, if they, if you're, then it's worth about 12 seconds. It didn't cost them anything. You should spend the 12 seconds reading it, and then you say, I should give that 12 seconds back to myself. That was a waste. If it costs nothing, it's worth nothing. Now, on the flip side, if someone who loves us has a criticism for us, and it costs them some relational capital to say, hey, I got a problem, or hey, I want to share something with you, we should probably listen, because that criticism costs them something. Criticism that costs nothing is worth nothing. Now, the opposite of this true, this is true, this volume impacts validity thing. The opposite of this is true as well. And that is that the louder something is, the more it makes us think it's true. We can be way off base ourselves online in our opinion, but we can be, we can be because you know what? Here's the thing. There is so much affirmation on the far right and the far left or in making fun of someone. There's so much affirmation. And we can get comments, likes, shares, and those affirmations are loud and it makes us think all right. But just because you got a lot of comments, likes, and shares doesn't mean it was true. Volume, it makes us think that it was valid. But that's not always true when it comes to opinion and the last one is this opinions tone impacts touch come on you you know when you can have 30 people at the office tell you like great job great job great job awesome job you're doing great you're gonna do great great job great job great job 30 pats on the back and one person say well you know I had a problem with the way you did that and which one are you gonna remember right that one little criticism you had 30 pats on the back, but that one felt like a dagger through the heart. It's why we say oftentimes that it takes five positives to even balance out one negative comment. When we're trying to lead children or a classroom or coworkers or whatever it is, tone impacts touch. It feels different. When the opinion is negative, it just touches us differently. It's pricklier. It's sharper. 17 years ago, I was just a couple of months away from planting a brand new church. And uh, we had a sponsor church that was sort of helping us get going. And we had invited these consultants from a really big, huge church that was one of the only churches planting other churches. There, there weren't a lot of people doing that 17 years ago. Campuses and churches, plants, it just, it was very new on, on the scene for churches to be doing that. So we invited these consultants down for two, week, two um, days of training with the sponsor church and my launch team, and it was just great. There was like so much momentum in the weekend, and we were getting fired up, and, and you know, we were, we were learning things, and we were scheming a plan, and we were figuring out a calendar of what we need to do before the first Sunday worship service, and I mean, they, they, we closed out those two days, and we were ready to change the world for Jesus. It was, it was, it was great. So much energy and momentum and excitement. And one of my jobs was to drive these two consultants back to the airport. It's about an hour drive. And just me and these two guys in the car, and I'm fired up, ready to go, you know. The whole ride from the church to the airport for an hour, all they told me was how they didn't think I was ready, I didn't have what it takes, and that the church plant would fail. And I had like 35 people on my launch team that were like, you're, you're great, you're our guy, we're going. And they were excited, they were patting me on the back. But I just came home to Emily and I was just stunned, stunned. Another instance so happened a, several years ago. I, I had moved from one church to another and, uh, and I was kind of in a denominational system where they, they moved you to another church and, and I'd gone from a smaller church to a larger church and I'd been there a few months 
And I, I remember I had a church member come and sit down with me and just look me straight in the eye. And I can remember it like it was yesterday. He just said, hey, I just think this church is probably too big for you and you're in over your head. Whew. Let's hit you different. Doesn't matter how many people said good sermon that day. And you've had that happen to you. You've had a coworker tell you that. You've had a boss tell you that. You've had a coach tell you that. You've had a teacher tell you that. You've had some mean kid in class tell you that. And here's, what, what, here's the problem with those opinions, the tone of those. We start asking ourselves, what if they're right? Maybe I don't have what it takes. What if I am going to fail at this? What if I am in over my head? The tone when it comes to opinions it impacts the touch. So just know that they don't, they might ought to have equal weight, but the tone of the opinion changes how it touches us. So before I dig into this, these few short verses of that about Jesus and how he handled opinions, I want to just say there's three questions I think you should ask about criticism when you get it. And number one is, is it biblical? And if you're a follower of Jesus, this is super duper important because, hey, if someone's got a problem with me and it's biblical and I say I'm a person who is trying to be obedient to God's word, I need to listen. Is it biblical? And if even if you're not a follower of Jesus, if there's someone who's coming to you to this and giving you a, a, a kind of a, a conversation and an opinion, you have to ask yourself, what do I think about the authority of God? Am, am I interested in that? Am I intrigued in that? Because if, if it is a biblical issue, but I just say I want to do it my way, then I have to ask myself, who's the authority in my life? Is it God or is it me? Is it biblical? Now, not every issue is a biblical issue. So we can't just say, like, well, it's not a biblical issue, so your opinion doesn't matter. So the second question is this. Would you take their advice? That's kind of a what. What is the criticism? Who's giving it? Is this the kind of person from whom you would want advice? Do they have integrity and character? And if the answer is, you know, this is a person I really respect, then maybe we need to listen because they're the right kind of who. If they're an anonymous troll on an Internet chat room, probably not. I wouldn't take their advice, so why would I take their criticism? And the last one is, is it helpful? This is so hard. To, this is a hard question to ask because whenever we get criticism, what do we all want to do? Get behind our Captain America shield. I just want to deflect the arrows. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to talk about it. No, 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 I don't want to hear it. You're just trying to be negative. You're just trying to be a hater. And sometimes you just have to go like, no, no, maybe they're just trying to be helpful. Is this someone who loves me, who wants what's best for me, who sees that I am in error and is trying to help me? Is this someone, are they trying to be helpful? Is it hurtful or helpful? And if they want to be helpful, I want to, I want to listen to that. So, Let's talk about this few, verse, few verses where Jesus had to deal with how to handle opinions. Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully human. And he dealt with these issues. And if you think the internet is bad, imagine being able to read everyone's mind. Just imagine being able to be in a room like this and go like, I know everyone's opinion in here. Oh, he thinks that about me? Oh, she thinks that about me? And he had to figure out what he was going to do in this, this human world that he was in when people had opinions about him, some good and some bad. John 2 tells of how Jesus performed his very first miracle. He was in a wedding in a little community north of Nazareth called Cana, kind of almost out in the country. And his mom kind of says, kind of, talks him into it like, hey, it's time, son. You can, you can do this. And he turns water into wine at this wedding, and man, word begins to spread. And of course, back then, it was just like, hey, you won't believe it. I was at this wedding. Hey, you won't believe it. My cousin was at this wedding. Hey, you won't believe it. My best friend's brother-in-law's sister was at this wedding. It just starts going from there and going from there, and word spreads about what's happening. And then it says Jesus travels to Jerusalem where the Passover is happening, which any Jew who is anyone would go to Jerusalem for this time. And in Jerusalem, he makes a name for himself in a different way. He goes into the temple as would be his custom to go to a town, but especially uh, to the main temple in Jerusalem. And there are people who have set up shop to sell things. 
And in this sort of famous scene, he turns over tables. He tells people to get out. This is not supposed to be a place to be buying and selling stuff. This is supposed to be a house of prayer and a house of God. And, man, people are talking about this rabbi from Nazareth who turned water into wine, who walked into the temple like he owned the joint. And then this is what John writes. In John 2, verse 23, and if you got your Bibles, you can kind of turn them to John 2. We're right at the end of the chapter there. If you're watching at home, we're so honored to be wherever you're at. If you got your app or your Bible, it's going to be in John 2. And if you don't have a hard copy, grab one at the bookshelves on the way out. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs and wonders he was performing and believed in his name. Many people began to have a good opinion about him. Jerusalem had a population of about 25,000 people at the time. Most scholars believe that during Passover, up to 150,000 people would descend on Jerusalem. And you see, it's not just a Passover, it's not just a holiday, it's a whole festival. It's a whole festival. They would come a week early, set up tents. It was like Talladega, basically, okay? I mean, 150,000 people coming into town, craft shows, food, you know, worship services, festivals, just, just the whole deal. And John doesn't write how many. He just says, hey, there's 150, 175,000 people here at this time of the year, and many people begin to to believe in Jesus because apparently Jesus is doing more miracles while he's there. People are being healed. People are, uh, are finding new life. There's all stuff, and people are started talking, and many, many people began to believe in his name. And I love this next little verse, and John is the only gospel writer out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that record this little verse and this little story about Jesus. Listen to what he says next in verse 24. But Jesus, though he's gaining popularity, though many people are believing him, though, though the opinions about him are great right now, would not entrust himself to them. For he knew all people. They had so many great things to say about Jesus. Oh, listen, this is the guy. Did you hear what he did at the wedding? Did you see? I mean, he was so cool when he, you know, in the temple and the tables and everything. He really told him who was boss. Did you? Oh, he he healed my sister. He he healed my cousin. He healed my dad. So many people have got opinions about him. And Jesus says, but Jesus would not entrust his identity to them because he. He knew all people. And can I just say, I don't think this is a Jesus superpower moment. I mean, come on. Do you know people? You know how people are? They're fickle, right? They love you one minute, and they don't the next. They, they, they praise you to your face, and they talk about you behind your back. I mean, you have... You have lived long enough on planet enough, Earth enough to, to know people, right? You don't have to be Jesus to know that people are kind of fickle. And Jesus, it says that he knew them, and he, would not, he did not want to entrust himself, their identity, to their opinions. Because this is what Jesus knew. Even though their opinions were great right now, even though that they were, everybody was singing praises and many people were believing him, if, they live, if you live for their compliments, you'll die by their criticism. Like if you entrust your identity to right now because everybody's happy with you and everybody's proud of you and everybody's singing your praises, then you will die by their criticism. If you let the compliments go to your head, the criticism will go to your heart. You can't, you can't entrust yourself to them. Now trust is a bedrock, foundational for relationships. You, you can't have a marriage, you can't have a family, you can't have deep friendships without trust. But there's such a big difference between trusting someone and entrusting my identity to someone. I, I say oftentimes that Emily, my wife, 
she makes an awesome wife and an incredible mom and a lousy God. And I make an okay husband and dad, but a really lousy God. You cannot entrust your identity to a spouse, to a boyfriend, to a girlfriend, to a parent. They are incapable of giving you your identity. Incapable. And I love the way John closes this out. He did not need any testimony about mankind. For he knew what was in each person. And the, this, the syntax, if you're an English teacher, the syntax of this sentence is a little odd. In, in uh, different translations don't always help. The King James Version said, and he needed, and needed not any that any should testify of man. A little hard to kind of explain. There's two words for man in this sentence. This word for any just like we would say any, we understand be like any person would be behind that. The word here in the Greek is the word tis. It's one man, one person, any per, kind of means any person. And then the word for this in the, in, the, in the NIV that was just up there, it said mankind. Here it says man. It, the Greek word is anthropos. What word do we get for that? This is the part where you talk. <laughs> Anthropology. You get anthropology for that, like the study of humankind, the study of humanity. So what, what this is saying, maybe a better way to say this that, that would be a, a syntax that we could understand is like Jesus didn't need to hear what one person had to say about all the other people. Jesus didn't need to hear the opinions that one person had about another. He didn't need to, Jesus didn't care to hear the opinions of what one man had to say about other men, what one woman had to say about other women. He did not need to hear what the opinions of one person had about everybody else. He didn't need to hear, the, including himself, because he knows what we're made of. And you're smart. You know what people are made of. So Why? Have you entrusted, why have you entrusted your identity to someone else's opinion? I have some sobering news for you. If people criticize to Jesus, they're going to criticize you. Jesus was perfect, and people had opinions of him. And I don't know all of you personally yet, but I've got a hunch you're not perfect. And I know I'm not. So if they had opinions about Jesus, they're going to have opinions about you. And people are going to have opinions about us. But I think Coach Sam Pittman was on the right track. Because the only opinion that counts the only opinion in all creation that counts is your creator's. The only opinion in all creation that counts is your creator's. And I know some of you, some of you carry the weight. Some of you young people, college students, middle school students, high school students, you carry the weight of the opinions of some kids that are giving you a really hard time at school. Some of us in this room carry the weight of the opinions that our parents had about us. Or you carry the weight of what a teacher said or what a coach said. Or what, if you, some of you have estranged grown up children who have given you their opinion about what you are as a parent. Some of us carry the weight of what an ex said about us in a first marriage, in a second marriage. But the only opinion that counts in all creation is the one who created you. And a few paragraphs later, Jesus would, would say how much God's opinion was of us. When John records the most quoted and famous passage in all of Scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son 
so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the next verse after it, it is famous, but it's just as good. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. You want to know God's opinion of you, the only one that counts? For God so loved you that he gave his one and only son so that you would believe in him, so that you would not perish, so that you could have everlasting life with him. God did not send his son into the world to condemn you, but to save you through a relationship with him. You want to know what God's opinion of is of you? You were worth his son dying for. You were worth Jesus leaving the glory seat of heaven for the gory scene of the cross. You're worth it. You want to know what God's opinion of is you. Just look at the cross. Why won't won't you let go of this identity of other people's opinions? and latch on to the opinion of the one who created you. Because the only opinion in all creation that counts is your creator's. So don't let what someone else says make you. Embrace the opinion of the one who made you. In this series, we've talked about a lot of opinions lie identities that sometimes we believe we are our past sometimes we believe that we are the image that the world has tried to put on us or we're compared to other people and that's what we think we are and today we talked about being opinions and one of the the songs that we've sung in this series is called Jira and you may have sung that song or heard that song or maybe you're new and you're like what in the world does that word mean it's actually a Hebrew name for for God that comes from Genesis 22. In a season in which the Lord provided for Abraham, and listen to what Abraham said in verse 14 of Genesis 22. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide, or he called that place Jehovah Jireh. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of Lord, it will be provided. And so often we want to read that verse and say that it's, you know that God's going to provide for us materially or God's going to provide for us financially. But the thing I love about this song, the promise of God through his love of Jesus Christ in us for sending his son is that he provides for us a new identity. He provides for us an enoughness because we're not enough. A worthiness because we're not worthy. We are loved because he loved us first. And so what I want to encourage you with today, we're going to close with this song uh, one more time. And as we get ready to sing it, I I, I want to invite you, if if the Lord would lead you to come down front, because I want to tell you something. The number one thing you have to do to embrace this new identity is to make your life new in Jesus Christ and if you have never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior I just want to tell you you will go through your life chasing every other identity that will never be enough in your spirit and soul it will never be enough no matter how much money you make no matter how you compare to anybody else no matter how good opinions people have about you there will always be a God-shaped soul in your heart because your identity is supposed to be a son and daughter of God and you only get that through faith in Jesus Jesus Christ. So I want to invite you to come to say, Lord, I repent of my sin and I I cast off my past. I receive your forgiveness. I believe you died on the cross for me and I receive the freedom found through resurrection. And I believe it. I don't understand how it works, God, but give me a new identity, a new soul, a new spirit, a new heart, and a new start. Maybe you did that a long time ago, but somehow comparison opinions, your past, images keep covering up that identity. And today is a day to say, I lay it down again to you, God. I am enough because you are enough. And I want to be known as your son and daughter. Heavenly Father, we pray with me. 
Thank you for the identity that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for every person in this room, Lord, to to own that identity, but especially today, God, I pray for those who have never placed their trust and faith in you, that they would take a first step to say, I want to be identified as a son or daughter of God through putting my faith in Jesus Christ. And it might be a scary step, God, but it's such an important step. So I am praying for those today, Lord. Thank you, God, that you make us enough because you are enough. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and sing? And uh, those uh, that would want to come down, you come down, kneel down. If you want somebody to pray with, some of our elders and uh, leaders and pastors are going to be hanging out. I'll never be more loved than I am right now Wasn't holding you up So there's nothing I can do to let you down It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud I'll never be more loved than I am right now Going through a storm So I wouldn't drown You've never been closer than you are right now Child, you are in love Child, you are in love I will be content in every circle
Our hope and our prayer is that as you walk out of these doors, that that's where your identity would be found, and the fact that He is enough, and because He is enough, you are enough. Hey, we're so excited that you joined us this morning. Next week, we kick off a brand new series called When Life Goes Wrong. We're going to be diving into the story of Joseph. That's one of my favorite stories. Um, so make sure that you plan on joining us. And we have a Bible study that's going to go alongside of it that our small groups are all going to be doing. So if you're not plugged into a small group, this is a great time to get plugged in, get connected. And what a great place to also have people encourage you in your identity. Like, what a great place. So we'd love to encourage you to do that. Hey, we'd love to introduce you to someone. This is Glenn Denton. Hello, hello. If you are new around Mountaintop, we would love to meet you. Today is Meet the Pastors. We do that the first Sunday of every month. And so our pastoral team is going to be outside underneath the green tent. Stop by, say hello, and I've got a free t-shirt for you if you do. See you there. Awesome. She's going to be heading that direction, uh, so make sure you stop there. But before you leave, we say this every week because we want to remember, God is for you. We are for you. Let's be for Birmingham. Have a great Sunday. <laughs>